My name is Fran Costigan. I am a pastry chef that happens to be specializing in vegan desserts. Some people call me the diva of dairy-free desserts. This is one of the classrooms I teach in. This is the Natural Gourmet Institute in New York City, where I teach a vegan baking boot camp, among other classes, and I teach in other schools. I do consulting really all over the country. I was trained as a traditional pastry chef. That is my background. I decided to change my diet after doing some reading and was determined to see if I could make absolutely, unquestionably, luxuriously delicious vegan desserts using whole grain, whole foods-based ingredients. I tend to make things that I love. I lived on peanut butter cups. I can't go near a peanut butter cup now. Probably wouldn't even taste good. And then I do go back and have a taste and think, has my palate changed or did they take all the good stuff out? You know, I was a little girl when I tasted them. So I developed a peanut butter cup. What I do is I think, okay, I need something that's creamy, but I can't use whipped cream, I can't use butter, what am I going to do? Tofu has a really neutral taste when you use the correct type of tofu and treat it properly. It gives you this creaminess and mouthfeel, and I've also started using avocado for the same reason as the base. When it's creamed, it's rather neutral. I recently was in Paris. I remembered opera cake. Wow. And I was able to deconstruct it. I said, well, what do I need? I need a nice almond layer that's dense. There is a place to use a liquid sweetener, such as maple syrup, for example, because I'm looking for something that's very moist. I need a mocha buttercream. Well, I'm not using butter. What am I going to do? And I won't use I won't use margarine. So I know the qualities, I know the properties of these ingredients. I'm using ingredients that other people, that I used before, that people use. I'm using flour, I'm using baking powder and baking soda and sweeteners, but I'm also using some apple cider vinegar because that will help a cake rise a bit more and create this lovely tender crumb. It's really the same thing that I did when I was baking more mainstream desserts was I'd look at a recipe, a, a photograph and say, wow, or I'd go out to dinner and have something and say, that's great. How can I recreate it? Now it's how can I recreate it in a, how can I veganize it? How can I recreate it in a vegan virgin? I was asked to do an organic vegan Twinkie, for example. That's a spongy kind of a white cake with must be a very sugary, greasy tasting white cream. I adapted the vanilla cake recipe in my book, The Vanilla Cupcake. It worked very well. I got myself some Twinkie pans. I wasn't trying to replicate a Twinkie. Very easy to do now because there is organic shortening on the market. There's organic confectioner sugar. I wanted to make something more healthful. So my cream was tofu based. I added some vegan white chocolate and I know to add a little bit of acid. I used a little bit of lemon, grated lemon. And another secret is a little bit of white miso because using a little miso in a tofu cream tends to give it an almost imperceptible but important cheesiness. Portions, I think that's part of the reason that cupcakes are so popular and we're all talking about chocolate being healthful. If it's a dark chocolate, the antioxidants, so I try to weave that in. Cocoa nibs are very popular now, very high antioxidant. How can I use them where they make sense? Many people today are allergic to nuts, but nuts add a certain quality to a dessert. The walnuts are bitter. I started using cocoa nibs in place of walnuts. Cocoa nibs for me are too bitter unless they're coated in chocolate, which is the next step. These are cho this is a chocolate covered cocoa nib. So I started using them in place of walnuts. People love raw desserts now, but they're really pushing the envelope. So that's where I started using avocado and chocolate rather than tofu and chocolate. I started working with raw cocoa powder to see how, what would happen I tend to use, prefer Dutch processed cocoa. You know, it has um, 
frostings made with Dutch process are delicious. But because I'm getting so many requests for it, I want to see what I can do with this. Who I'm working for or with will oftentimes dictate the types of sugar that I'm trying to develop a recipe for. The closest granulated sweetener that we have to white sugar is an unrefined sugar. It hasn't been through the last filtering process. Vegans who do use conventional white sugar tend to use beet sugar rather than cane sugar because beet sugar oftentimes has not been filtered through bone char. It's really, it's charcoal by the time that happens. So vegans tended to like beet sugar. Now, very recently, beet sugar is genetically modified. So now you have the vegans who don't want to use anything having to do with animals, but also want to eat more healthfully, more in line with sustainability and so on. Certainly nothing that's GMO. The only assurance they can have of using a granulated sugar is an organic cane sugar. And there are many on the market. So I call, I refer to that as light cane sugar because it is grown organically. I take another step and I use fair traded sugars where people are paid a fair wage. Again, you know that there's no slavery involved and so on. And I find that it is the closest, gives me the closest result to a cake or a pastry or a cookie that's been made with white, what I call white sugar. Some people don't want that. They want a, a darker, they want a more whole sugar and then you have a product like this. This is Sucanat, which is an acronym for sugar cane natural. This is the whole sugar cane, the entire sugar cane crushed. The molasses is never separated out of it and then it's evaporated into this product. It actually, they're wonderful because if they retain the molasses, you get this nice under flavor. I'm working without eggs, which contribute flavor, without butter that contributes flavor. So anything I can do, I layer flavors. It's, wonder, it's a wonderful product. But if I'm making a delicate vanilla cake or a delicate lemon cake, I may want to use the lighter sugar. And anecdotally, I know people who have insulin issues who are really happy after eating products made with agave. This is a light agave, this is considered a raw agave. Raw simply because it hasn't been heated over 118 degrees and that's another really seems to be a big trend now. Of course once you heat it it's not raw anymore and this is another light agave. They actually come from different species of agave plants. My liquid sweeteners, maple syrup which is very natural and people who have allergies or some other reason that they don't want to use cane sugar are very happy with maple syrup and maple sugar, which is just maple syrup that's been dehydrated. It's very costly and it can lend a maple taste. So you, you go where people want to go. But I mean, there are trends now. I'm finding people are really, people across the board, not just the two coasts, are really sophisticated about their products. People are expecting a more refined product that they did in the beginning. When I say in the beginning, I'm really going back about 15 or 18 or 20 years at the most where someone who wanted a healthy dessert, and I always go like that because it's still dessert. So this isn't where you're gonna get your healthy. But I can do much more sophisticated items because the ingredients are available to me and the need is there. People know and people demand. I get called into very fine restaurants in New York City as a matter of course. People are coming in and they want a dairy-free dessert and I don't just want to give them a fruit plate. But there is an expectation of deliciousness. There is an expectation that the ingredients are wholesome. I have, as again, I really watch people. I go into big markets. I listen to what my students say and what my clients say and then I go into markets and I watch people and they're all reading labels and they're all looking for that extra bit of something. People seem to be seeking out organic, seem to be talking about fair trade. I work with people from all over this country and abroad and I'm hearing it so it's, I think there's a great awareness. Some people are environmentalists 
who are saying this is the way we need to eat because it's gentler on the planet. I just bought a, I bought a plum recently that had a sticker that said kosher and gluten free. Was there ever any gluten in a plum? No, of course not. But you know, people are doing marketing. Um, I think the general public is aware that the word natural by itself is a marketing term. It doesn't mean anything. So they're looking for something that's natural with a more specific definition. And that would be organic or whole. Because everything I do is vegan, that means there is no trans fats, zero cholesterol. I absolutely don't tell them ahead of time. I've tested my theory with blind tasting, so to speak, where I have vegan cakes side by side and I'll say, taste this one, it's made in a traditional way, and taste this one, it's vegan, it's fabulous, and they prefer the one that's not vegan, even though it's vegan. I don't want, that's good for what it is, I want this to be absolutely delicious. And so, that's really key, don't bring something out and say, you're going to love these cupcakes, but you're just not going to believe what's not in them or ditto the chocolate cake. What I'm clear is the next step to conscious eating is portion control. I think people really want to know what they're getting, their own little personal dessert, absolutely gluten free absolutely gluten-free. That is not a matter of, okay, I'm going to take this recipe, pull out the flowers, and put in a gluten-free mix. It's different. It's doable, and it's different, but you're never going to get a result quite like this. Here's an example of a gluten-free, all-purpose baking mix. These are available everywhere now. You don't have to go necessarily to a specialty natural food store. So gluten-free people, they never prefer gluten-free, but they are really sick. And it is a very serious and very growing problem. How is it that there's an explosion of allergies? Some of it is better diagnosis, I'm sure, but I think it's the food itself. I think it's the food system. Wheat seems to be a big problem for many people. Or wheat allergic, that's different from gluten-free. Some people are able to tolerate spelt flour in place of wheat flour. Spelt is wheat, but it's an, more of an ancient wheat. It's an unhybridized wheat, which got me thinking, and this must have something to do with what we're doing, the way we're growing the food. I use some quinoa. People, once they learn how to pronounce it and wash it properly so it doesn't taste soapy, people really love the taste of quinoa. Some of the others I find, it's a, it's a hard sell unless it's in a seriously health food store box, because people almost think that it's an engineered product, something like amaranth, teff. I use rice flour that, um, all of these grains in combination, but quinoa is very high protein. It's a great grain to use, a great grain to use. I use some cornmeal. It's a great grain to use. For me, I'm at a place where I feel I have the taste nailed. I know how to take this cake that I saw in Paris and tasted and remembered, and I know how to do it. Or I'm, I know how to take some guar gum or xanthan, which are you know newer things. I know Elizabeth Faulkner is using that as well, and get some amazing textures. Now what I want to do is go further with the organic and fair trade. I think that's the next thing that's happening. And if I have a platform, that's really what it is. Vegan desserts are officially trendy based on what I hear, the calls I get, the numbers of requests I get from people who are mainstream. Oh, there are a lot of books now with really catchy titles, vegan books. You know, it's not your grandma's vegan anymore.